Let's pray together, shall we? As we get into God's Word, reminding ourselves that the Word of God is inspired by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is the Spirit of truth. So we're depending on the Spirit of truth to help us understand and apply the Word of God. So let's pray. Father, I thank you for the privilege of opening the Word this morning. We thank you that we have the freedom to do that here in the United States. Uh, we still have that freedom. Thank you, Lord, that uh, your Spirit is here. Your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God who, who, who enlightened the writers of the Word and inspired them, and that now these scriptures, as a, as a consequence, these scriptures are God-breathed. And we pray, Spirit of the living God, come and fall afresh on us. Help us to read and apply the Word of God as it, for what it is, the Word of God. And Lord, I pray that we would not leave this place unchanged, but God, that you would you bring that change that you want to bring in our lives so that we would be more like Jesus. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. So I just want to, want to read John 15, 1 to 17 together. Okay, so if you have your Bible uh, on your phone or, or, or whatever, uh, you want to use the Pew Bible, that's fine too. I'll be reading from the e ESV. Uh, but the version you have is the North is the NIV. <laughs> yeah. But in, anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll understand. So Jesus has one of these wonderful "I am" statements, and and his readers, his his Hebrew readers, would understand that he's saying "I am" and and, and making himself in very clear sense, equal with God. Okay? So he says, I am. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I have spoken to you, he says to his disciples. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. He says it again. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch that withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, Jesus says, that you love one another. That you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that he, someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know his, what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. May God bless a reading of his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. I got this big old black heavy preaching Bible. 
This is my preaching Bible. It's my preaching Bible because it's in extra large print. So I can see it clearly. With or with, almost without my glasses, almost. I can put it down there. I can still read it. I like that. It's my preaching Bible. Well, Pastor Dave set us up well last week. If you were here and if you were listening. He talked about, he talked about obeying the commands of Jesus. Do you remember? Talked about obeying the commands of Jesus. And, and in your notes, if you go back to your notes from last week, you'll see, I think it's 12. 12 commands that he talked about and wrote down in, in the notes. Uh, John Piper has a book out these days, and he talks about the 50, 50 commands of Jesus in the New Testament. Uh, I haven't read that book yet, and I would like to, to see what he's getting after. But uh, anyway, there are commands of Jesus. So Dave talked about that, and you know, it's kind of like he, uh, he threw me the basketball, I was up at the net, I went up, grabbed that puppy, and slam dunked. So now we get to put the ball in the net today, okay, on John 15. So, but before we dive into this, this chapter, chapter 15 of John, uh, I, I want to tell you about a, a pastor that I know. This pastor preached faithfully about 47 or 48 Sundays a year for several years. Uh, he counseled, led Bible studies, visited people in their homes and in their local nursing homes. He conducted funerals and weddings. He served on a committee to address homelessness in his area. He helped to teach and lead Awana on Wednesday nights. He served on the church board and did several other things. Something you would not know about this pastor is that he was running on empty. He was running on empty. Like a car, like a daring driver, driving with an empty tank with just enough fuel to get to the pump which is something I did this week, sorry to confess. I went up to Madison this week, <laughs> left Rockford on a quarter tank of gas. I can tell you how much gas it takes to get to Madison. A quarter tank. <laughs> I was just about running on empty. Anyway, after a few years of this exhausting, empty lifestyle, this pastor hit bottom. He hit bottom. Depression kicked in hard, consuming the little joy he had left in him. He came to the place where he, unknown to his wife, his church people, or his friends, he was contemplating suicide. He had a plan and was often thinking about that plan, dreaming about it at times. Then this pastor saw a light at the end of the tunnel, and it was not an oncoming train. It was hope. It was the beginning of restoration of joy and peace and spiritual life and the fruit that comes from renewal. He found a soul friend. With a couple of people, he came to restoration and renewal. I want to talk to you this morning about life, real life, abundant life, the kind and quality of life that only Jesus can give. John begins this chapter by quoting an important statement that Jesus made about himself. It is that another I am statement, as I mentioned earlier. It is that statement, I am the true vine. Have you ever asked yourself why he says true vine? True vine. I'm the true vine. In, in the Old Testament, Israel was supposed to be the vine. But there was a problem. Israel was a, was a disobedient vine. They were, they were set up to be a nation who, if you looked at Israel, you'd say, now there's a people whose Lord is the God, the real God, the living God, the God of gods, the only one true living God. Look at this nation, and come on, come join them in worship. 
Come on to the temple. Let's worship together. All you nations, there's a place for you in the temple. Come worship with us. That was God's intention. And Israel is supposed to be the vine. But they're a disobedient vine. And the prophet Isaiah writes this about Israel as the vine from Isaiah 5, 1 through 7. Lisa's going to read for us. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. He looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. So by declaring that he is the true vine, Jesus was saying that he is the true son of God who has been faithful and obedient to the Father and the one who gives life, unlike the nation of Israel, because they turned away, they turned toward obedience, they turned away from, from Elohim, from Yahweh, from El Shaddai, from the Lord our peace, the Lord our banner, the Lord our hope, the Lord our God. They turned away from him toward other gods and looked for those other gods to help them. But Jesus was saying, unlike that nation who was supposed to be the vine planted by God, who would offer life to all the nations, that he, he himself, is the true vine. He's the obedient son of God who gives life to all nations. Amen? The one sent by the Father to give life to all his followers. When we come into this faith relationship, this faith relationship with Jesus, this trust relationship, this trust relationship with him who is obedient to the Father, he gives us eternal and abundant life. John says this in John 10, 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came, Jesus said, that they may have life and have it to the full, abundantly. I came that they may have life and have it full life, abundant life. That's what he came to do. Jesus can do that for us because he is the true vine. He's the true vine. The true life-giving vine planted by the vine dresser, the Father. When Jesus has given us this kind of life, however, <laughs> okay, however, he expects something from us. He expects fruit. The text says, every branch in me, followers of Jesus, in other words, that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Some translations, I think NIV says he cuts. That's not a great translation. It's not the word. <laughs> Sorry, but it's not the word. He takes away. He, 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 re he lifts it up. He lifts it up like it's dragging in the ground. He lifts it up and takes it away. Okay, that's, that's what the, the better translation of that word. Every branch that does not bear fruit... But he, and he prunes those that are bearing fruit, that they may do what? Bear more fruit. Bear more fruit. 
Coming into true life in Jesus is a life of transformation. If we think of Moses as the lawgiver, we can think of Jesus as the life giver. He gives life. He gives life. When we come into this life if, if, through Jesus, through faith in him, there will, be an, there will be evidence of the transformation. There will be evidence of the change. The theologian Bultmann writes that the fruit mentioned here by Jesus is every demonstration of vital faith or the vitality of faith. The star bit of that vitality being love. Selfless, self-giving love. By this, the text says, by this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And so prove to be my disciples. Did you catch that? You and I prove that we are we have experienced this transformative life when we give evidence to the fact, and we give evidence to the fact that we are Jesus' disciples. When our life is full of fruit, or the evidence that Jesus, Jesus' life is in us, which is typified by the love of God resulting in obedience to the Father. I'm going to talk about that some more a little later. Obedience to the Father. Cross Point Church, Cross Point Church, are you listening? You online, are you listening? This is important. I want to say this to you. I want to say it carefully, and I hope you hear it this morning. May God rescue us from the idea that Jesus saved us only for a life in heaven without any expectation that, we, that right, we live right here and now with evidence that eternal and abundant life is our experience now, here and now. What is the nature of fruit that Jesus expects to see in our life here and now? Peter picked up on that in his second letter where Peter writes this. Make every effort. This is 2 Peter 1, 5 through 8. Make every effort to supplement or add to your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection or the brother or sister type of love and brotherly affection with love, agape, that self-sacrificing kind of love. For if these qualities are yours, Peter goes on, and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. If these, if these character qualities are there and are increasing, it keeps you from being unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What are these qualities? Let me summarize them. Virtue, that is moral excellence. Knowledge of God. Self-control. Steadfastness. Hanging in there even when it's tough. Godliness. Brotherly affection. And love. When people close to you look at your life, those who know you well, do they see those qualities in you? See, I can look at you from here, and I don't know. <laughs> I can't really tell. We get together on Sundays, and so many of us, we don't even get a chance to talk to each other. That's why we have growth groups, small groups of people that are get together and get real together. Take off the mask for a while. We get real together. We talk about their concerns. Talk about things they need to repent of. Talk about things that they need to have others help them with. The word prune. Excuse me a minute. The word prune 
Every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. The word prune is the word from which we get our English word catharsis, which means to make something clean. God is going to faithfully, carefully get rid of the stuff in us that isn't good for us and isn't pleasing to him. He's going to prune you. And it's kind of like being disciplined by your heavenly father. It doesn't always feel good, but it's necessary to get rid of those things that don't please him, don't don't, glory, don't, don't help you. He prunes them off. By the way, I'm available for haircuts after the service. <laughs> he prunes. He makes clean. Every branch that does, not, that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Jesus comforted his disciples with these words. You are already clean. Same word as verse 2. This is verse 3. You're already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. These disciples didn't need to be pruned or made clean at that point because Jesus had spoken his word to them. And they heard the word. They applied faith to the hearing. And they received the word. And they changed their lives because of the word. I remember one, one text where 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 Jesus said some very hard things, and many people left him. He talked about, uh, about his body as, as, the, the, as the flesh to, that people would eat, and his blood is something they would drink, and he was, he was pointing to his crucifixion. They didn't understand that, but he said that, and many people left him. The disciples didn't leave. And Jesus turned to them and said, What about you? What about you? In other words, are you going to leave me too? And they said, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. They were getting it. They were starting to understand. They were starting to understand the words that he was speaking were words that came from God. So even though they didn't understand fully they applied faith, and they were steadfast. They hung in there. They obeyed. Pruning in our life means God has to cut away some stuff that isn't helpful, isn't glorifying to him. Shortly after I came to trust in Jesus, I went to a seminar, and the leader of the seminar talked about getting things right, not with God, but with people, people whom you had wronged, maybe before you even became a follower of Christ, people you cheated, people you stole from, people you wronged in one way or the other. You hurt them. And the, 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 the leader of this seminar encouraged us to think about it, pray about it, and go back to those people and make things right. So I did that. I made a list of people that I had wronged. As the Spirit of God and the Word of God made it clear to my heart, I made a list of people I had wronged in my life. And one by one, I went to them. And I said, I wronged you. I sinned against you. And I'm asking you to forgive me. That was not easy. <laughs> but as I went to each one and told them, some of them I had to remind, you know, what I did. I had to remind them. What, as I did, I went to them and they said, don't even worry about it. I said, no, 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 no. What I need to hear is, I forgive you. And that's what they said, I forgive you. And that was a period of pruning in my life. That was stuff that I had to get right. That I had to clear up. Why? So that I could be a more fruitful disciple of Jesus. 
with those things out of my way. Our Father in heaven is a good vine dresser or farmer. <laughs> He's a good farmer. He sees the stuff in our lives that need to be pruned so that he can, we can bear more fruit. It might not feel good, but it's necessary. Okay, let me ask you this. Is there anything in your life that you know needs to be pruned? Is there anything in your life that you know needs to be dealt with. It needs to be put away. It needs to be put off. But for some reason, one reason or the other, you feel shame. You, you, you feel burdened by this. But you've just been hanging on to it for some reason. And you haven't allowed God to deal with it. How long are you going to hang on to it? How long are you going to bear that burden that Jesus wants to take away from you? How long are you going to go on without letting God prune that away? Can I ask you to be an obedient vine, obedient branch, I mean, and deal with that today? Let the Spirit of God do some pruning in your life. It might be difficult. Maybe people you have to apologize to maybe things you need to get right with other people with your family your spouse even things you need to deal with and get right don't hang on to it don't keep going with that burden deal with it get it right Jesus also reveals the key to being fruitful. Jesus reveals the key to being fruitful. And here it is, this lovely word, abide. Abide. Abide, remain or stay in me. And I, Jesus says, I will abide in you. I will abide in you. You abide in me. You hang out with me. Hang in there. Don't run away. Hang in there. Stay close to me. Obey and love him. Hang in there. Stay close. And as you do that, Jesus promises, I will abide in you. Did you know that Jesus, by the person of the Holy Spirit, abides in you? abides in you he abides in you he hangs out with you when you wake up in the morning sometimes you say oh lord it's morning <laughs> how about saying lord it's morning <laughs> there's a difference abide 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 as the branch cannot fr bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine neither can you abide uh, you, neither can you produce fruit and except you abide in me, verse 4. This is a practical illustration of what Jesus meant in the first part of verse 4. This gives some clarity to the idea of abiding, remaining in him, in Jesus. We are invited into this abiding relationship. Jesus promises, as we do, he will abide. He will live in us. He says, I am the, branch, I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. It is clear. Is it clear enough to you? Do you feel like Jesus needs to make this even clearer for you? Okay, here he goes. Hang on. Here we go. If you keep my commandments, it's getting very practical now. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have abide, just as I abide in my Father's commandments and abide in his love. You see, that's the key of Jesus being the true vine. He obeyed his Father's commandments. He did everything the Father told him to do, including going right to Calvary, right to the place where he would be crucified, even though he knew it was coming. 
in the Garden of Gethsemane. He was really having a hard time with this because he knew what was next. And he said to the Father, if possible, let this cup pass from me. This cup, talking about the cup of God's wrath against sin. Let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this. This isn't easy. This is hard. Let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will. Jesus went back to his disciples. Here comes Judas Iscariot with the troops. Jesus is arrested. And you know the rest of the story. The branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in Jesus. What if we aren't even connected to Jesus and his life is not really in us? What happens to us if we're just playing some kind of religious game and faking it? Showing up Sunday mornings or whenever, you know, pasting this little plastic smile on and pretending like we're a follower of Jesus, but we're not. What happens? What happens? He knows. That's right. He knows. What happens to those people who aren't connected to the vine? Here we go. If anyone does not, this verse 6, if anyone does not abide, remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. Burned. Jesus go back, go, goes back into illustration mode, illustrating this, his spiritual point with a, with, with a vine-dressing reality. The branch that does not stay connected to the vine is going to die. And when it dies, it will be thrown into the fire because it is dead. It's not going to produce any fruit. It's dead. This reminds me of the time when Jesus and his buddies were walking, going someplace, and they came across this tree, and the tree had no fruit, which was strange <laughs> because it wasn't the fruit-bearing time. But Jesus saw this tree with no fruit on it, and he did something very strange. He spoke to the tree, and he said, you're cursed. You're cursed because you got no fruit. Though he loves people who are far from him, though he loves the sinner who says there is no God. By the way, atheism is, a, is, is such an, an empty argument, right? I don't believe in God. I don't believe there is a God. What God are you talking about? Do you get that? <laughs> An atheist saying, there is no God. I don't believe in that God because there is no God. What God are you talking about? It's a really shallow argument. But Jesus cursed that tree because it had no fruit. And they came back later and saw that the tree was all dead and withered. Good for nothing. Jesus goes back in illustration mode, illustrating his spiritual point with a vine, this vine-dressing reality. The branch that does not stay connected to him, the branch that is not in him, is going to dry up and die. And then the, the vine dresser will come. And even though the vine dresser loved the tree and loved the branch, he has to take it away and get rid of it. Because it's dead. Jesus warns that if there's no evidence of life transformation, that the fruitless branch will be lifted up and taken away and burned. Is it possible for you or me to be taken away? 
if there's no fruit or evidence of the life transforming presence of Jesus, no evidence of real faith or trust in Jesus in our lives and flowing out of us, the answer is yes. Because if there's no evidence of life in you and you are dead like the dead branch that produces no fruit, the farmer takes it away and gets rid of it because it's dead. When your day of reckoning comes and you're found to be a counterfeit, and not truly one who has the transformative life of Jesus in you, there is going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a reckoning day. There'll be no more time to fake it. Jesus himself said this. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of of heaven but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, says Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. You worker of iniquity of lawlessness. We can fake it, can't we? We can fake it, play a phony religious game and fool people, but you can't fool the all-seeing, all-knowing God. Can't fool him. He sees right through it. <laughs> he knows who is who, who are his own. He knows who are his own. And he knows those who are just playing a silly game. Let me warn you, friend, don't play that silly game, that empty game, pretending everything's okay, pretending like you're, you're a true child of God. If you're not, if you're not, would you do the best thing you could possibly do? Confess Jesus today. After the, after the service is over, after it's all over, I'm going to be right down here. I'm not going back there. I'm going to be down here. I'm not going to ask you to make big parade or anything. I'm just going to ask you after the service is over, I'll meet you down here. We can talk about it, okay? And there'll be some, some people over here to pray for you. There'll be others who, can, who you can talk to and pray with. Some of our elders or uh, shepherds are here. You can talk to them, pray with them. Don't fake it because you can't make it. Okay. So you might be thinking, hey, Jim, <laughs> hey, 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 hold on here. I thought the gospel was good news. you just given us a bunch of heavy stuff, a bunch of bad news. What, what's up? <laughs> what's up, bro? Well, I'm about to turn corners. Jesus makes a wonderful promise. He says, if you abide in me, you hang out in me, you stay with me, you stay connected with me, you obey me. You love me. We stay in relationship. You abide in me. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Whoa. Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Wait, wait, just a minute here now. Do these words, this promise, do these words, this promise seem familiar to you? It should. Jesus made a very similar promise back in verse uh, chapter 14, G, that that Dave talked about last week. There he says, whatever you ask in my name, this is chapter 14, whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. It's the promise of Jesus. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Living a life of fruitful intimacy with Jesus opens up that honest communication with God and, and we lift our prayers to him and we pray to him and we ask stuff of him and we, 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 we lay our, our burdens at his feet. Uh, we, we know that the God of all comfort will, will help us and even if he doesn't take the sickness away, he's going to meet you in the sickness and he's going to be there for you. He's going to hold your hand through it. 
You wonder, God, are you with me? He said, I'm not, I'm not only with you, I'm carrying you. I'm carrying you through this difficulty. I'm, a, I'm not only holding your hand, I'm holding you. <laughs> and you can count on him. You say, Lord, won't you, won't you end this illness? Won't you provide for me financially? Won't you do this? Won't you do that? He'll do what's right in his name if you pray in his name. I've been asking the Lord for some time for a Ford F-150. <laughs> I don't know. A Dodge would do, but <laughs> a Chevy is okay. But I've been asking for, for a fairly new Ford one F-150. And guess what? <laughs> I don't have one yet. <laughs> In fact, I, I, I haven't had much time to pray for it lately, so I, I've actually given it up. I see Ford, new Ford F-150s go by, and I think, God has blessed them. Good. Good. Okay. Enough of that. Um, Whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So live a life of intimacy. And you can't expect God to give you everything like a spoiled child. You know, like a spoiled child. (laughs) I was walking with Lisa and our our kids and this friend of our family out of this restaurant. We're in this restaurant together and we're walking out of this restaurant. And I, and there's this, you know, these big bubble gum machines where you can get this big old honking piece of gum. For 25 cents. <laughs> I don't know what got into me, but I just acted right then, right there, as a, like a spoiled child. And I started whining and crying and making a big scene and asking for a quarter. And some stranger said, Here, kid, take this and shut up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's more good news. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Hang out. Park yourself in the love of Jesus. It's verse 9, verse 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. That's actually 1 John 3, 16. 1 John 3, 16. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. He literally laid down his life for us, Jesus did. Isn't that amazing? The Son of God, the eternal Son of God. Let's just pause there for a minute. He laid down his life for us. As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so I have loved you. Jesus, the eternal Son of God who lived with the Father in eternity past, came into this world, took on flesh, hung out with us, became fully human and yet fully divine. He became a servant for us. He suffered for us. He died for us. He rose from the grave for us. He was exalted to the right hand of the Father for us. He is preparing a place for us in the Father's house. And one day he's coming back to take us to be with him. If that isn't good news, I don't know what is. Best news ever. Best news ever. Jesus loves us. This we know. (laughs) For the Bible tells us. So so what do we need to do now? Verse 10 says, if we keep, keep, if you keep my commandments, Jesus says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Verse 12 says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that somebody lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends. You're my friends. Jesus calls you a friend. You're my friends. You're my friends. No longer do I call you servants. This is verse 15. For the servant does not know what his master is doing. But I have called you friends. You're friends. 
For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not cho choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, remain, so that whatever you ask in my Father, Father's name, he may give it to you. Not like a spoiled child expecting everything you want. Asking as a mature follower of Christ, saying, Father, if it be your will, would you do this? As we are abiding in Jesus, you and I, abiding in his love, abiding in his word, Crosspoint is and will continue to be a community filled and flowing with that life-giving presence and blessing, which is the love of God. Amen? The grace of God, the mercy of God, the kindness of God, the goodness of God will be more and more like Jesus toward each other and toward our community. And in, in this, God will be glorified. God will be glorified. So as I wrap it up now, conclusion part two. <laughs> Are you a healthy branch of the true vine who is Jesus? Are you a healthy branch? Is his life and love evidence in your life? Are you bearing the fruit of faith, joyful obedience, love for God, and love for people around you? Crosspoint is not a religious club where card-holding members consider themselves insiders. This is the church, the body of Christ. He is our life. Without him, we are dead men walking. True Jesus followers abide in the vine. They stay close to Jesus, follow him, obey him, and love him. Do you remember that pastor I mentioned to you at the beginning of the message? That was me. That was me. I was that pastor. I stopped abiding in Jesus, in his word, in his perfect love for me. And instead, I just kept working for him, more like a servant than a friend who is the lover of my soul. My friends, brother, sister, don't go there. It's a dark place. Don't go there. Obey Jesus. Love Jesus. And the people around you. It's just really that simple. Abiding. Abiding. Abiding in his love. Abiding in his word. Living the life of Jesus. That transformative life of Jesus. Live it out. By the power and presence. Of the Holy Spirit. Who lives in us. As I said earlier, after everything's done, I'm going to be right here at the front. No parade, no big thing. I'm just going to be here at the front. If you're at that dark place, your life is ebbing. Your spiritual life is ebbing, going away. I hope to meet you here and talk with you afterwards. Because there's hope. There is hope. There's joy. There's peace. Jesus wants you to have that. Jesus wants you to live in it. Okay? All right. I'm going to be quiet now, and I'm going to hand over to, to Tom, but I'm going to pray first, and then I'm going to hand over to Tom Douglas, and he's going to come and lead us in communion. Let's pray together. Lord, we are hungry. We're thirsty for righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come and fill us. Come and fill us. Come and fill us with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit, and fill us anew. Fill us afresh. For those who are without hope, give them hope. For those who have no peace, give them peace today. For those who are listening online, give them peace and joy and a deep sense of your, your presence and your smile. In Jesus' name.